Good afternoon everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you all for attending. This is my second go at this uh, audio-visual webinar type presentation and I hope this one turns out to be as well received as the first one. It's extremely helpful to me and to everyone if you guys would post any comments and suggestions at the end of how we can improve things so that uh, we can keep on improving and giving you more and more information that's worthwhile to you. I've really tried to make this presentation in slide format very simple. I haven't clouded it with a lot of numbers. We can discuss numbers during the discussion as questions come in. I really urge you to begin posting your questions now so that uh, when I get to the end of this presentation we can get going quickly and answer the questions. Um, you may find somewhere along the line we've had a few glitches. Sometimes the presentation will just cut off and if it does please stay with us and uh, give it a minute or two it'll come back. Um, I'm going to extend this presentation for beyond an hour so that if anybody has questions that do not does not get addressed in the beginning stick around don't disappear after an hour I will continue to remain on for at least another 30 or 45 maybe even 60 minutes to address any questions that are outstanding and please be aware that this presentation is is going to be recorded and archived on this page so that you or any friends that you want to recommend to go looking at it uh, just let them know post it and let them know to go and uh, search for this presentation on the website and they'll be able to see it I want to remind you again and I will at the end uh, when I'm through and it was very helpful the first time round I know there are many of you that feel you'd like to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation going with me um, on the issues we're discussing today or perhaps on other unrelated IVF issues uh, please feel free to call up 1-800-780-7437 or just book a free consultation on the website and uh, I will um, I will be happy to talk to you all you have to do is call up and set it up quite a few of you did from the last consultation and I really enjoyed meeting you in person and many of you had a lot of comments that were helpful and uh, hopefully uh, you'll do the same this time and at the end of the day when we're all through with this uh, please know that these consultations are free to anyone residing in a, the United States or in Canada and I'm going to urge you to also go to my blog which is ivfauthority.com all you need to do is go to the home page and on the upper right hand column you'll see a small search bar just post any topic in that you wish to have covered click on it and it'll take you to the relevant articles I have, I've written about 250 of these my most recent article that was posted today is on Im, is on implantation and the factors that affect it uh, please read that article it's in two parts there'll be the second final part next week also go to Facebook have a baby dot have a baby facebook.com have a baby and feel free to post any questions there and again I invite you all to frequent the discussion board on this website uh, enroll in that discussion board and post any question on the SRM Las Vegas discussion board uh, you can have a full expectation that I'll respond promptly so let's get going we're talking today about embryo transfer and the factors that play a role here so to start with let me remind you what I showed you last time when we spoke about immunologic issues and other causes of implantation failure let me remind you that success with IVF requires an optimal seed soil relationship most of what uh, goes wrong with IVF when it fails is to do with the embryo the seed uh, but the endometrium plays a very important role as well 25 percent of the time when an embryo fails to implant to attach it's because there's something wrong with implantation we discussed this in detail that talk was archived in a previous uh, presentation um, we're talking today about implantation and how to facilitate it through a proper embryo transfer but before that let's just touch on the factors that affect the ability of an embryo to implant properly there are four issues the first is number one the contour and symmetry and regularity of the uterine cavity which we measure using an ultrasound using saline sonography 
That's the easiest way. It's a simple outpatient procedure. We inject some water into the uterine cavity. It distends the cavity slightly. And then by doing an ultrasound, seeing that sound traverses fluid very easily, you can see the contour. You cannot use an HSG because with a hysterosalpingogram, which is a dye x-ray, the dye can obscure, because it's, it's, a, it's radio opaque, it can obscure small lesions growing in the uterus, which if present, of course, as you know, can interfere the implantation. So the contour of the uterine cavity is, is evaluated by saline sonography or hysteroscopy, not HSG. Then there are the immunologic factors, which we spoke about before. I'll touch on later on again. If a woman's got activated natural killer cells in the uterine lining, all women have got natural killer cells. They're good guys. They improve the ability of an embryo to attach. But if they're activated and they're releasing cytokines, Th1 cytokines in excess, they can destroy the embryo's ability to attach. So when you transfer the embryo, you've got to be sure that the uterine cavity is regular. The third one is the, um, the endometrial thickness. And uh, we need to have an endometrial thickness that measures at least eight millimeters. Ideal is nine or better. But if it's less than eight, there's a problem. So an eight millimeter, at least preferably nine millimeter lining is what is needed after the transfer for the embryo to implant. And then of course comes the very important issue of the technical uh, the technical expertise involved in doing the transfer. There is nothing that is more critical in terms of IVF outcome than placing an embryo meticulously in the uterine cavity. We spoke about the seed and we spoke about the soil, but this is the farming, the planting of that seed in the right season, delicately, carefully, in the right location, gently. And then, of course, supporting that embryo once it's in there with the appropriate hormonal support after the transfer during the luteal phase. These are the topics we're going to cover in this presentation to start with. So now the next issue becomes firstly looking at, let me go back, the contour of the uterine cavity. As I said, there can be no surface lesions in the uterus. And the, here's an example of a saline sonogram or a hysterosonogram. Here you can see the cavity of the uterus that is distended by some fluid that I've injected in here. And you'll see a little polyp in the uterus protruding. This is small and it's no more here than about six or eight millimeters, but its presence evokes a foreign body response that will re re reject the embryo. So it's very important to know that before you do IVF, every woman should undergo a saline sonogram if she's not had had one done a year or 18 months before that was normal. Once you see these polyps, you can then go in and do a hysteroscopy, which is the next procedure I'm going to show you here, a hysteroscopy. And here's a picture inside that woman's uterus of the polyp you just saw. It's on a thin pedicle like a mushroom. You can see the fluid and the hysteroscope is a telescope-like instrument we introduce into the uterus to allow us to visualize the interior for scar tissue, for polyps, for a septum. Here there's a polyp and all you do is you go behind it, snip the little stem or the pedicle and extract it. What you don't want to do is do a DNC and scrape out the entire uterine lining just before an IVF cycle because it's likely that if you do that you'll remove the very basal layer of the endometrium making it difficult for the endometrium to grow properly again in the very next cycle. You need at least one uh, month um, one month's break for the uterus to restore itself and now I'm going to go to the uh, to the next one which is endometrial thickness. I went to that this is endometrial thickness as I said, here's an optimal endometrium. Notice that it is thick. Here it measures a 2A, which to me means more than 9 millimeters. The 2 means that it has a trilaminar appearance, a white outer line and border, and a stripe in the middle. This is the endometrium. This is the basal endometrium. 
and this is the interface between the front and back layers. This is like a fillet, a sagittal incision, that you're looking at a sagittal um, picture of the endometrium. Uh, when I first saw this, and I, I and, a, and a doctor in Canada in late 80s, early 90s were the first to describe this pattern that is necessary for a good lining, uh, for a good implantation to occur. When this lining is less than 8 millimeters, it is inadequate. I do not transfer embryos to a uterus if the lining is under 8 millimeters. The commonest causes of a lining under 8 millimeters are that the woman has had a previous infection in the uterus due to a pregnancy that, got, that, that, that was lost or pregnancy that resulted in the birth of a baby where products of the conception were attained and became infected through bacteria that ascended from the vagina through the cervix into the uterus and damaged this basal layer so that it, was, so that it no longer was able to propagate a good lining. That's hard to treat. Other causes are when a woman gets older, this is a problem, a condition because it affects the vascularity and the delivery of estrogen through the blood vessels to the lining. Another cause is adenomyosis, where the glands of the uterus grow into the wall of, of sorry, the glands of the endometrium grow into the wall of the uterus like a, uh, like a, um, seaweed and so disturb the vascularity it can also occur when there are lots of fibroids in the uterus that disturb vascular blood supply and the carrying of estrogen to the lining to make it thicken and it occurs with a condition we rarely see today where the woman's mother took um, took uh, estrogen hormone in the form of diethyl stilbestrol when she was pregnant with a baby and that subsequently ends up needing IVF we don't see much of that today Finally, we see a poor lining when the endometrium, the basal layer, cannot respond to um, estrogen because it's rendered insensitive by the wrong protocol of ovarian stimulation. That is for another time. Here's a very poor lining. It's a two because it's got the three trilaminar appearance, but it's very thin. This lining measures less than eight millimeters here and is not going to support a pregnancy. One of the things we can do when there's a poor lining, uh, I went to the wrong place now, let me go back. Uh, one of the things we can do when we get to a poor lining is try to improve blood flow to the uterus by causing the blood vessels to dilate and carry more estrogen to the lining. What we do is we can use estrogen to increase the amount of estrogen delivered aspirin which relaxes the blood vessels and the muscle wall but mainly we found and I published this in the mid 90s that the use of sildenafil or Viagra vaginal suppositories administered four times a day into the vagina will improve blood flow uh, and dilate the blood vessels so that more of the estrogen is carried into the lining. It works very well, it works poorest when the cause of the thin lining is damaged to the basal layer due to previous endometritis following a pregnancy uh, that was either miscarried or delivered and left products of conception behind that became infected. Um, then the next slide shows what happens. Here's a patient who had a very poor lining on the 10th day of stimulation and in that lining uh, you'll notice it was very thin. We gave her vaginal Viagra suppositories and this is the lining she produced. This is really, really a good lining. Look how it improved from this to this in a matter of three or four days. So we'll now go to the next slide. And now we're going to talk about the, uh, recept the immunologic factors that we spoke about earlier and the endometrium. I really don't want to beleaguer this again because of the fact that um, we spoke about it last time. But very important to know that when the embryo reaches the uterus and signals the natural killer cells, which are the immune cells that predominate in the uterine lining, the immune cells will then receive the embryo if the embryo is different, genetically different to the mother. If for any reason the man has got um, um, a genetic makeup, we look for in the genes DQ alpha that is similar to the mother then the embryo that arrives in the uterus is regarded as being non-self because it looks too similar 
to the uterus and what it will then do is it will evoke activation of natural killer cells and cytotoxic lymphocytes and when these Th1 cytokines predominate they attack the embryo's root system and destroy it. Treatment of that is the use of intralipid. We first introduced IVIG with Dr. Coulomb in the mid-90s to treat, um, to treat uh, natural killer cell activation but it was a blood product, it was very expensive and had a lot of side effects. Five or six years ago, one of the doctors in our group found that uh, intralipid works just as well and it's all but replaced the use of IVIG, is just as effective, costs 25 times less than IVIG and because it's not a blood product, it doesn't raise the concerns and also intralipid um, works very, very well in down-regulating these natural killer cells. We give it along with steroids, either in the form of dexamethasone or prednisone, and that works extremely well as well. Now, the next uh, I want to get to, and I went the wrong way there, is to talk directly about the embryo transfer technique. But before we do that, let me quickly sh bring it into perspective by showing you how the embryo transfer process works and where it comes in. Firstly, when it comes to embryo transfer, there are a number of factors that have to be considered. First, embryo selection. That's for another day. Here's how do we choose an embryo that is the best quality possible. I have more and more come to recognize that embryos that do not reach blastocyst stage, they don't get to day five or day six, uh, they, they don't reach blastocyst stage, such embryos are usually abnormal chromosomally and they won't make a baby or they'll miscarry. So I have tried to restrict my embryo transfers to blastocysts. Now sometimes we put the embryo in earlier if the woman has only got one or two embryos, but by and large using blastocysts for transfer, the development of the embryo, there's a little bit of a crossover here, the development of the embryo is better. You can transfer on day two or day three. In England they tend to go on day two and more in the United States, much more day three. But as I say, my preference by far is to put back blastocysts rather than earlier embryos, because those that don't make it to blastocysts are abnormal anyway, so why do you want to mess with them? And who are you kidding anyway by doing that? Um, the grade of the embryo is assessed by looking at its morphologic structure, how it appears under a microscope. And we have grading systems, the one that was developed at SIRM in 2000 and reported on by my partner Dr. Fish is called the Graduated Embryo Scoring System or GES. It's a very good microscopic grading system but it doesn't have the ability to be very very good in selection because ultimately it is the chromosomal genetic makeup of the embryo that's going to determine whether it can attach and make a baby. And this chromosomal makeup cannot be seen under a microscope. In 2007, we were the first to report on the use of a genetic test called CGH to identify which embryos are normal. And using CGH, along with only confining the transfer to blastocyst, if I transfer a single blastocyst that is CGH normal into the uterus of a woman, the chance of a baby resulting is around 60% from a single embryo. Now, I'm not suggesting that CGH makes better embryos. It identifies and selects them. So CGH and morphologic grading together with the GES system help us to select the best embryos for transfer. The next step in embryo transfer is to be able to know exactly where you're going. So you need to map the cervix and the uterine cavity. And uh, in the past, we used to use a method called mock embryo transfer where we'd put a catheter in beforehand to measure the uterus so we could see where to go. That is not a good idea because every time you introduce something through the cervix into the uterus, you also introduce bacteria. So embryo, um, using this method of mock transfer to see where to go is a bad way to go. It's just as easy and more efficient to map the cervix's uh, direction and the length of the uterine cavity in the cervix by ultrasound just at the time of, just before you're ready to do the transfer. The next issue is do you do fresh or frozen transfers? 
There's a lot of evidence today that using uh, newer methods of freezing called vitrification, you can read up on that, um, uh, read up on this on my blog, embryo vitrification, you don't harm the embryo. So embryos that have been vitrified and frozen ultra rapidly can be kept indefinitely. They have virtually the same viability as fresh ones do. And you can put them back in a steady manner, one at a time, and you'll see me refer to this later on. The fresh transfer is still the preferred approach today. And we, as I say, prefer to do fresh transfers. And we do them preferentially using blastocysts. Frozen embryo transfers are also with blastocysts because I personally don't recommend vitrifying or freezing embryos that haven't proven at least that they're worthwhile considering by taking them as far as the blastocyst stage. We've spoken about the timing of the transfer. I can tell you that I totally disagree with the concept of transferring embryos on day two because they haven't had time to prove themselves. An embryo that reaches day three and is at least six to nine cells at least has a reasonable chance of attaching. Many will not make it to blastocyst and those that don't make it to abnormal which is why I prefer using blastocyst transfers preferentially. Then there's the question of preparing the patient. I think counseling is extremely important to explain to the patient what's, what this is all about, what you're exactly going to do and help her do some imaging in her mind of what she should be thinking about positively the power of positive thinking or prayer or meditation, whatever you want to call it, is, I believe, a very important part of embryo transfer, and it requires a little bit of time to explain what we're about to do. And a bit of sedation goes a long way, a little bit of Valium or something, 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes before the transfer, helps relax the patient a lot. The next is the technique. The patient is in lithotomy, meaning on her back, uh, with her legs up on holders, and she must have a full bladder. The reason for the full bladder is often questioned by patients. There are two good reasons. The one reason is that it pushes the uterus, and you're going to see this later, into the right position. It keeps the uterus in a flat position, making it easier to do the transfer. But an equally compelling argument is that when the bladder is full, there's reflex inhibition of uterine contractions. Uh, and you, you know that those of you that have pe friends or have had babies yourselves will remember that the moment you've given birth, the doctor empties your bladder or tells you to empty it. Because when the bladder is empty, the uterus contracts down. So we want the uterus full to have the reverse effect of relaxing the muscle and re reducing the amount of contractility once the embryo is pushed in. Second, the, uh, thirdly, there's really no argument today. Ultrasound guidance, either by two-dimensional or three-dimensional ultrasound, is the only way to know where you're putting the catheter. Since you don't, you can't see the embryo itself that is emitted from the catheter when you eject it, you sure as hell have to know exactly uh, where to place it. And the best place is around the middle of the cavity. This you can see easily under ultrasound guidance, and an assistant holds an ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound probe, over the suprapubic area, allowing you to see exactly where to place the embryo. And then there's the catheter, and how you prepare the catheter. I have a special technique for preparing the catheter, because I believe if you put an empty cannula, which is the little sheath through which the catheter is passed into the uterus, if you put that directly through the cervix into the uterine cavity, you'll scoop up a lot of mucus in the cervix in the process of doing that. And that's not a good idea, because when you then transfer the embryo, when you put the catheter in and transfer the embryo, you push that mucus through the end of the catheter into the uterine cavity, and the embryo can stick to it. So when you then pull the catheter out, the embryo comes back out with the catheter. That's not a good idea. What I do is I use a blind solid catheter with no lumen in the middle, and I push that into the, cath into the sleeve, into the catheter, introduce the catheter under ultrasound guidance right up to the point where the cervix enters the uterus. I then push out any mucus with a thin, by, by pushing the catheter through the end of the, just about a few millimeters beyond the tip. This gets rid of the mucus. Then the embryologist comes along with a catheter that has embryos loaded or one embryo loaded, and that is passed via the sleeve into the uterus to the right position and then emitted. The emission of the embryo is also important. It must be done gently. I do it in a two-stage emission. 
The embryologist injects it gently into the cavity. We wait 10 seconds and then the embryologist injects the sec gives a second push and that pushes the embryos directly out of the catheter and at this point the catheter is slowly, very slowly, very gently removed from the uterus. This technique is a very helpful way of preventing embryos being retained in the uterus when you pull the catheter out, which is a big problem. The more mucus you scoop up in the catheter as you go through the cervix, the more likely you are to have embryos retained in the uterus. And then when you pull the catheter back, they come into the cervix where they are sequestrated and they die. The final part is the luteal phase support. I don't want to go into this too much. I have an article on my blog on this. I urge you to read it. Whether you use progesterone by injection, by vaginal suppositories, uh, by the injection of something like crinone, which is a solution which contains progesterone into the vagina or other forms of progesterone in the vagina, or whether you use it orally is all subject to debate. Some would even debate whether progesterone even helps. It probably doesn't help unless you use a Lupron long protocol. And in that situation, you definitely do need progesterone, I think. You can add some progesterone to create that 1 in 20 balance in the absorption between estrogen and progesterone. And I published some time back on the use of HCG rather than progesterone, so that rather than giving the woman progesterone alone, you give her HCG, which makes her ovaries produce both progesterone and estrogen. The problem of using HCG is that you then have great difficulty in diagnosing the pregnancy because the HCG you get you give gets into the bloodstream and interferes with the diagnostic ability. So now I'm going to show you why it's so important to get the uterus into the right position. It's not a particularly good slide, but this is the uterus and this is the bladder. This woman, you can see, had a uterus that was almost vertical. You sure as heck don't want to put a catheter in and lodge an embryo in a vertical uterus. There's, there's a thing called gravity which we want to avoid. And there you'll see the second one. Now I'm introducing fluid into the uterus through a catheter into the bladder. And as you inject more and more fluid into the uterus, the uterus is dipped. It's, a, it's pushed down by the enlarging bladder. Watch this uterus. Keep your eye on the uterus as the more fluid goes into the bladder. Now you can see how the uterus itself is pressed even more flat from more fluid being introduced in the bladder. And here the uterus is almost where you want it horizontal. Also notice that when you've got the uterus in the right position, you can see the endometrial cavity better. And that's of course in that exact spot where you want to put the embryos. Now you don't have to use fluid injected into the bladder. You can have the woman drink more and more fluid and wait till the bladder reaches its right, the, uh, its right degree of distension flattening the uterus. That is preferable. But sometimes the bladder is completely empty and you need to get on with it. And using sterile technique, you can then introduce water into the bladder and so flatten out the uterus to make an easier transfer. Here the uterus is completely flat. Here's the bladder. Notice the catheter has been introduced and the tip of the catheter is now just near the entrance to the cavity of the uterus. That's where we stop and up to this point there's a, there's a solid little catheter in it to push out any mucus that might have been inside the catheter, inside the sleeve or the cannula. And so the cannula is now in place with the catheter. Now we're going to remove that, that blind, that solid catheter and the embryologist is going to come along and put in another one which contains the embryos. Here you can see the catheter has been removed and I'm basically putting in the, um, the excuse me I've got a phone going off which I'm going to get rid of and put it in the drawer. Okay so here we have a catheter with the embryos being introduced through the sleeve up to the point at which the cannula is positioned right near the uterine cavity and now you're going to see the next one I'm now introducing the catheter through the end of the cannula which remains positioned there and I'm introducing the tip of the catheter to that point and now we've re released the embryo into the uterus the catheter is there and at this point the catheter is slowly removed that is a, is a transfer that is gentle 
Uh, it puts the embryo exactly where you want it to be. It hasn't traumatized the cervix, and because you've had the uterus in the right position, you've got the best chance of avoiding trauma. Now the catheter has been removed completely, and I've done another ultrasound abdominally and can see the embryo in a little globule of fluid. In this case, it was a single embryo I transferred in that little globule of fluid into the woman's uterus. We, we don't know if this woman is pregnant yet because, as you can see, this procedure was just recently done. And here we have another picture of an embryo in the uterus. I drew a little fictitious heart around it in the hope that that would eventually lead to a baby with a heartbeat. In this case, this particular woman did give birth to a child. She has this very picture in her album. So now we come to the second last slide that I want to point out to you. It's the concept of transferring single embryos. And as I said, by far preferential, and there's no reason not to. Blastocysts should be transferred because embryos that are make it to blastocyst are 95% likely to be abnormal chromosomally, and you don't want them anyway. And the important point I want to make is that with the advent of vitrification that I referred to earlier, because we now can ensure that the embryo is safely preserved and will not lose its viability by being stored even indefinitely, we can put one embryo at a time and we don't have to put in more and take the risk of multiple births with all of its risks of premature delivery and the increased risk of complications in pregnancy, especially in women that are getting older. So single blastocyst transfers can completely replace the multiple transfers. I don't transfer more than two at a time anyway, and single blastocyst transfers are the way of the future. If you have three embryos, and they're all good embryos, and you tested them and they CGH normal, and you put all three in together, there's a strong likelihood you'll produce triplets. If you put them one at a time with two months gap in between each, then those embryos are going to be able to uh, propagate um, uh, three babies over an extended period of time. That's the point that I want to make. So you can lower the risk of multiple, lower the pregnancy risk, reduce the multiple pregnancy risk, and avoid the financial, family, and social problems and medical problems associated with multiple births. Now, the last slide is. Again, to remind you, I, I urge any of you that are interested, as was the case in the, after the last uh, presentation, feel free to call this number and set up a free consultation to talk to me. If you live in Canada or the United States, it won't cost you anything. And those consultations can be done through video conferencing. So please do that, and uh, I'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, you can visit the website and go to the discussion board of SRM Las Vegas and I will answer any questions that you post there quite quickly. And then finally, I think you'll find, for those of you that have been there already, that my blog, ivfauthority.com, provides a lot of information. I don't think you'll find the same information in any one other site on the Internet. So go there, go to the top upper right-hand column, type in any topic you want to, click on it, it'll take you to the relevant articles. Finally, please visit us on facebook.com, have a baby. And now, at this point, please, those of you that have not posted questions, post them, and I'm going to take them one by one and answer them as best I can. Let's go to the questions. Right. Looks like your picture's frozen on there. It seems to be frozen for a second. Just give us a few minutes. Okay. We're now going to get to the questions if we're lucky. All right, Let's start at the very we'll start at the bottom. First question um, is, where am I now? Um, it says, Dr. Sher, I have a, I, I did a donor egg cycle that in which I achieved a healthy pregnancy. I'm being treated for natural killer cells. I did this at your New Jersey office. We have frozen embryos. We've done three frozen cycles and it probably continues up above. Let's Where does it continue above? Show me. How do I do that? that okay. I don't know what the question is, Karen. 
Um, it was cut off. It was cut off for some reason. Maybe you can repost that question. I'll, I'll get it later. Um, Ashley asked the question, how often should a saline sonogram be completed, especially in situations where IVF treatment can be years apart? In my opinion, Ashley, if you haven't had a saline sonogram within 18 months of an embryo transfer, it should be repeated. Uh, the next question says, I had hysteroscopy in January 2012, polyp was removed, when should I try my next saline before IVF? If you've had a surgery to remove the polyp, it's a very good idea to repeat that and maybe um, do it two or three months later just to confirm that the uterine cavity is in fact, is in fact uh, um, clear. And now there's another question. Would you freeze a blastocyst that has already hatched? Absolutely. There's no problem in doing so. We do so all the time. In fact, contrary to popular belief, partially or completely hatched blastocysts do very well. Now, if they partially hatch, the embryologist will tell you that it makes, a, it, it makes a lot of sense and it's a good idea to gently put the embryo back inside the shell of the, of the envelopment, the zona, and then freeze it, which is what we do. Um, here is a question which said, I had an FET last month with a positive outcome. However, Thursday there was no heartbeat. Uh, I sched scheduled for a DNC in the morning, really concerned about how this will affect my future. It is, in my opinion, far more dangerous not to have a DNC. Because with the DNC, you remove the, the, the price of conception and you don't leave behind dead tissue that can become infected with anaerobic organisms and damage your endometrium. Besides, also, if they do a DNC and remove the, the price of conception, it's important that they test it chromosomally. You want to know if that embryo that you lost, even if it's an empty sac, contained uh, a, a conceptus that was aneuploid, which means has an irregular chromosome number, because that helps you in deciding what you need to do next time round. Can IVF provide a better start for an embryo in women who suffer from autoimmune illnesses such as lupus? Your treatment of steroids in the body of immune response reminds me of an autoimmune, I don't know what, uh, an autoimmune, it ends there. The, the answer is the presence of immunologic factors in itself is not an absolute indication for, uh, for IVF, but it's a relative one because who wants to go and be on steroids such as corticosteroids or dexamethasone month after month after month in the hope you're going to get pregnant, you're going to put on weight, you're going to have emotional problems, you're going to not be happy camper, and you're not going to like the doctor much. It's far better to pack it all into one intensive cycle of IVF where you only are treated during the time that you need to be treated and then you get a break until you get to the next cycle and where the chance of a pregnancy is four or five times greater than in a natural cycle, at least. Uh, can a lining be too thick? No, only if, it is, if it's too thick due to pathology such as endometrial hyperplasia or cancer of the uterine lining Yes, that's a problem. Or if it's too thick because there's a fibroid polyp that is growing into the uterine cavity. Yes, that's a problem. But ordinarily, an endometrium cannot be too thick to jeopardize implantation. The question is, would progesterone in oil shots help for an FET antagonist protocol? With an FET, absolutely you need progesterone because you've knocked out the effect of the ovary with hormone replacement. So you do need progesterone supplementation. And of course, HCG won't work in that situation because the ovaries are switched off and it's not going to respond to HCG. The next question says, do you need a full bladder if your uterus leans forward um, or back? I think it's called a retroverted uterus. A retroverted uterus occurs in a third of women uh, and it's when the uterus tips backwards. It's not abnormal. But very often you don't need as full a bladder there because with the uterus tip backwards, filling the bladder up is not going to position it. You don't want to push it down further. So you've, you've got to evaluate each case in its own merits. Good question by Ashley. How does PCOS impact implantation or does it? Yes, it does, Ashley. Because women with PCOS tend to have high LH levels, which means that they 
produce a large amount of ovarian testosterone. You'll recall me telling you that there are certain hormones during the stimulation that can interfere with the ability of the endometrial lining to thicken properly. And in women who are not optimally and strategically stimulated with the right protocol with PCOS, they'll have so much testosterone around that the endometrium will not respond to es natural estrogen or to estrogen administered and you'll have a problem in getting a good lining. Many cases such as this, the woman comes back for a frozen transfer where the ovary suppressed and there's not even testosterone being produced and then when you give the estrogen the lining is good. You'll find many cases that will tell you I've got PCOS when I was stimulated, the lining was poor, the doctor then brought me up for a frozen transfer and I did better by, uh, because of what I just explained. But you can avoid that with using the appropriate protocol of ovarian stimulation. Um, I have a stenotic cervix and I'm nervous about the dilatation. Honestly, Andrea, if a cervix is so stenotic that you need to dilate it, then, I, then it's something I haven't seen. Sometimes the little opening on the outside of the cervix is a pinhole and you can't get the catheter through. All you have to do is stretch that a little bit. But you never, in my opinion, have to dilate a cervix to be able to do a transfer. You really don't. Something I never mentioned in this presentation is that in some women, because of polyps or fibroids in the cervical canal, because of problems that block the cervix, you can't get into the uterine cavity at all. I developed a procedure after a guy called Kato um, from uh, Japan and modified it slightly and this is called a transmyometrial transfer. In this procedure if the cervix is impenetrable completely and that is once every five years you put the woman to sleep and using a vaginal probe and a special needle known as a Kato ash uh, apparatus or needle, you pass the needle through the wall of the uterus into just to the periphery of the uterine cavity and then by transferring a uh, embryo transfer catheter through that needle you can deliver the embryo into the uterine cavity atraumatically and we've had many pregnancies that have occurred, not many, but pregnancies occur in a high percentage of those patients using the transmyometrial embryo transfer approach. Uh, it says, am I able to be under like you are, you are during the retrieval? You don't need to be under because you don't need, you know, with a stenotic cervix, there's no such thing as an entire cervix being stenotic. It can be compressed and it can be uh, irregular in its tortuosity because of fibroids or polyps and then you won't get through anyway. And under those circumstances, you're far better off with a transmyometrial transfer, which is very effective in such cases. Stacy asks, when you are in an IVF cycle, if your lining is not 8 millimeters, will you start Viagra during that same cycle? Uh, Stacy, the answer is yes, provided you start the Viagra more than 48 hours before you give the HCG shot or progesterone is given. Because once you give the HCG shot, no further thickening of the lining will take place through proliferation of the lining. So you've got to have at least 48 hours leeway to be able to transfer the catheter, uh, to, to be able to administer Viagra and give it a chance to work. Uh, the next question says, I did three frozen cycles, none of those achieved a pregnancy, what am I doing wrong? Wow, Karen, I, I don't have the answer. All I can say to you is, it could be that the transfer was wrong, that there wasn't the proper preparation, that there were implantation problems, and I again refer you to my most recent article, part one of which was posted on the blog today, or you could have an implantation failure due to immunologic factors that no one's found before. I urge you to give me a call, Karen. We can look into that and I can give you the advice, and I want to make it clear, these consultations come without quid pro quo. Whether I treat you subsequently or not is not the issue. I'm going to give you the same advice. You're not in any way obligated to me. So if you feel that you could get some answers and you'd like to discuss things, call up and we can discuss your case in particular and I can help you determine why these frozen cycles might not have worked. Magdalena asks, what is your opinion and experience with success rates where early blastocysts are transferred? 
Magdalena, it's not the question of the early blastocyst. It's the question of the chromosomal and genetic integrity of the blastocyst. If you knew which embryo was going to make a normal, chromosomally normal embryo and blastocyst, whether you transferred it on day two or day four as a morula or day five, you'd have the same pregnancy rate. It's just that when an embryo reaches the expanded blastocyst stage, you absolutely know that embryo has got the best possible chance of being normal, short of having been tested chromosomally. So to put back an early blastocyst, and do it on the early in day on day five is not a problem. Even on day six, it helps when you know that it was chromosomally normal as well. Because such an embryo should make a baby about 60% of the time if the uterus into which it's being transferred is a receptive or rendered receptive by selective treatment. All right, there's another question. Are there any physical symptoms associated with elevated natural killer cells? I'm afraid not, D. They just are not. Uh, there's another one here. Although fresh cycles from Ashley have a better success rate than frozen, have you seen cases in which an FET is a better option? Firstly, let me say, Ashley, this is by no means true. We now know that uh, vitrified embryos that are normal uh, will take just as easily as fresh ones. So there's really no reason to think that if you vitrify embryos and you prepare the uterus properly and you do a good embryo transfer, that the pregnancy rate should not be at least as good, and some might even say better, than with fresh. Uh, it's, you said you have had two fresh cycles, and both times I get the sense that my body is not recovered. Well, it all depends. Ashley, again, I invite you to call up and set up a consultation so we can discuss this because there are many possible factors that could be at play here. In some cases it may be better to even go primarily for a frozen cycle rather than a fresh. And we can discuss that if you give a call. Samantha, how long do you have to keep a full bladder after the FET transfer? We can empty it within 10 minutes of the transfer. So in other words, the moment the embryo is in the uterus, 10 minutes later we offer the patients a bedpan and the assistance to use it without any pressure. Um, the next question is, during embryo transfer for my last IVF, my physician was unable to position the catheter through my cervix. After about 25 minutes, uncomfortable minutes, he and another he called another physician and we were able to get it. Ashley, that's not good, as you know. The more you manipulate the uterus, the more it's going to contract the more it's going to squeeze the embryo back out or back into the tube or into the cervix. That's really not a good thing to happen. So it's more important to plan the trip before taking the ride. The fact that it ultimately was possible to get the embryo in means that there was a, a way to do so. And I would venture to recommend that next time there be proper planning done. And if it's going to be that difficult to do, that it takes 25 minutes with lots of manipulation, you would be far better off with a transmyometrial transfer. Denise says, I feel better now moving forward with the DNC. Also thinking about genetic testing and future embryos, does this usually have a better pregnancy outcome? Denise, if we know the embryo is normal and provided the uterus into which it's transferred is receptive and all issues relating to implantation that I outlined in my blog today that you should start reading have been dealt with. The things I mentioned earlier on in this presentation, perhaps you can look it over again, are dealt with. Then the answer is that if we know the embryo is normal and we place it into a receptive uterus, each embryo should give about a 60% baby rate, not pregnancy, baby rate. Because the same embryo causes that prevent attachment and implantation also cause miscarriages and sadly also birth defects due to aneuploidy such as Down syndrome. So yes, if you know the embryo is normal, then it helps. The DNC is a good thing to evacuate a uterus earlier. I wouldn't do it if it was an early less than six week pregnancy, but if it's beyond five or six weeks and there's a gestational sac that's been identified, I believe you're far better off getting rid of the products of conception completely rather than leaving them behind for the tissue to die and to become a great nidus for infection from ascending bacteria out of the vagina. 
D asks again, I have four frozen blastocysts. Um, where have I lost you now? Four frozen blastocysts that did not have PGD or CGH done. Would it be wise to transfer two since my embryo did not get tested? At 34, yes, if you, if, if provided they, you know, and I can't overemphasize this, that the uterus into which it's being transferred is as receptive it ca as it can be, and that the person doing the transfer has the necessary expertise to do a gentle farming job of planting the seed in the uterus, then it's better, then you might want to put back two, as long as you're willing to accept, under such circumstances, at your age, about a 30% risk of twins. Um, Magdalena, by the way, I don't say that lightly because even twins carry more risk than does a singleton pregnancy. By no means should anyone ever carry triplets or greater if possible because if you have a triplet pregnancy there's about a 50-50 chance that at least one of the babies born through prematurity or whatever will have physical or neurologic damage as a consequence of too early delivery and there's also a very good chance in about uh, in, in, in such cases of one baby not surviving. Are there different techniques to sodium chloride sonogram? And if so, how can an out-of-town patient be sure that the doctor she's seeing is doing it correctly? So when you do the IVF cycle, there's no, there's no damage. No, you use sodium chloride because it comes as a sterile saline solution, Stacy. That's the best way to do it and be sure after the procedure is done that the doctor gives you three to five days of uh, prophylactic antibiotics to prevent infection. Infection is extremely rare and I've never seen it after a saline sonogram and it's never occurred at SIRM that we've ever had one but it's a good idea to cover you against infection with something that will kill anaerobic bacteria as well as aerobic bacteria such as doxycycline. Magdalena you asked a question what would you advise against, against after the transfer? Any activity to avoid? Anything else? What about long travel? Magdalena, uh, six hours after the embryo is put in the uterus, it wedges in the glands, and you can do handstands if you wanted to, and you can do skydiving and it's not going to come loose. I don't agree that you should, because the reality is that it creates stress. The more active you are, that causes adrenaline, epinephrine release, and uterine activity, uh, uterine contractility. I think it's a good idea to spend the overnight as a couch potato. That doesn't mean flatten your back without moving. You can get up and walk around, and uh, this is a good time for ha for hubby to give a little bit of TLC, perhaps give you um, uh, cook for you and serve you and give you what you deserve as a as a queen. But the truth of the matter is that you're not likely to shake it loose. You can travel. Uh, our patients, 80% of my patients fly in from out of state to out of country and they come from very far. The day after the embryo transfer we send them home uh, by plane and these are pressurized cabins. It's not like you're going in a biplane. So you're really not subjected to any major pressure changes and as far as I'm concerned air flight traveling in anything short of a go-kart is not going to be a problem especially the American limousines that can drive you around comfortably is no problem in traveling. Um, do you? Yeah, thank you. Here we go. Um, I've done that. That one. Do you? Do you suggest fresh pineapple after transfer? <laughs> Anything that makes you happy, D. Have pineapple, bananas, grapes, whatever you want to do. Avoid after transfer drinking a lot of caffeine. Avoid taking medications that your doctor hasn't sanctioned. Try not to smoke, use alcohol or marijuana or anything like that. Those are things you want to avoid. But other than that, um, I don't see an, any problem with having uh, a healthy meal or um, refreshments. Um, if the tubes are blocked, do you have a greater chance of an ectopic pregnancy? Well, if tubes are blocked, they're usually b blocked because of damage inside the tube, which makes the the, the, the tube uh, um, uh, irregular with little areas uh, of outjutting scar tissue and things. And of course, that increases the risk of an ectopic. Ordinarily, an ectopic pregnancy occurs in about 1 in 30 IVFs. 
Uh, it's probably a little bit more frequent if the tubes are damaged because, believe it or not, when you deliver an embryo into the uterus, it doesn't stay in the uterus. Victor Knudsen, some years back, did a very elegant study in which showed that embryos actually go into the tube and then back into the uterus and into the tube and back into the uterus a few times before they settle in the uterus. So uh, if there's a blockage or damage in the tube from previous infection or whatever, there's a greater risk of an ectopic, in my opinion. I think we've about done everything. Uh, I'm going to wait another minute and answer any other questions if they come up. Other than that, here's one. Uh, is it possible to do CGH on a frozen five-day blastocyst and then transfer successfully? Of course it's possible, Shannon, but it's not advisable because you'd have to wait for the result for at least one day and so you'd have to hold the embryo overnight and then retransfer it. That's not a very good idea because you'll traumatize it by refreezing it. It is not bad if you have a day three embryo. You thaw it and then you do a biopsy, uh, send away for CGH, and then take the embryo to the blastocyst stage for fresh transfer or secondary fresh transfer. Or you could even refreeze it then without prejudice. But I wouldn't do a biopsy on a blastocyst and refreeze it immediately. That would traumatize it and reduce the chance of success. Is this one now? Mm -hmm. I had the most wonderful, this is Helene. I had the most wonderful uh, and special transfer, uh, thank you, with me last Monday. We felt that they were surrounded by a team, and by, by the A-team. Thank you, Helene. I'm embarrassed. I'm not going on with that one, but thank you for your kind words, Helene. Magdalena, any supplements you recommend taking prior to the IVF cycle? Magdalene, please, Magdalena, go to my blog. When you get to that search bar on IVF, authority.com type in nutritional supplements in IVF it'll take you to an article that I wrote on this very issue I urge people doing IVF not to use DHEA that's the only thing I don't advise because it converts to testosterone in the ovary and the last thing the woman needs doing IVF is more testosterone produced by the ovary so I it's the only supplement I think is bad those that are really good I think folic acid coenzyme Q and um, omega-3s. I usually recommend about 2,000 milligrams a day of omega-3. Uh, although we don't know this to be a fact and there's no evidence to support that it definitely does this, I wouldn't be surprised if the omega-3s will help in the treatment of natural killer cell activation. Remains to be seen and we're in the process of doing a study to look at it, but it's possible in my opinion that there may be some benefit there. Uh, Avion, what a beautiful name. If you have a family history of autoimmune diseases, vitiligo, lupus, and hypothyroidism, how important is lip interlipid therapy? Avion, 50% of women with immunologic hypothyroidism, and most hypothyroidism in women is immunologic, have natural killer cell activation. About a third of women with lupus and a third with vitiligo, and a third of women with, even with mild endometriosis have activated natural killer cells. Only if the natural killer cells are activated is intralipid therapy with steroids uh, valuable. And it's, a, it's almost 100% effective. So that you can level the playing field, neutralize this effect. I saw a young lady today who's done four failed IVFs before she came to me. And I was speaking to her because she's pregnant in about 12 weeks. And she has mild endometriosis, and we found natural killer cell activation. We treated her with intralipid, and on the first attempt we did in that way, she's now pregnant. Anybody with even the mildest endometriosis, those with a family history of uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or hypothyroidism, uh, and women with unexplained IVF failure or unexplained infertility, should, in my opinion, at the very least, have a natural killer cell assay done. But please bear in mind, this is not a test for the concentration of natural killer cells. It is a test for the activity of the natural killer cells. The test that needs to be done is called the K562 target cell test. The K562 target cell test. And there are only three or four, in my opinion, good reproductive immunology labs in the United States that can do this well. The, one, uh, the two that I favor 
it doesn't mean the others can't do it. But two that I favor are ReproSource in Boston and Reproductive Immunology Associates in Van Nuys, California. Lisa Miller asks, so the rate of ectopic is higher than in the traditional conception? Yes, because in regular conception the risk is about 1 in 120. So it's about four times more common in IVF. Um, thank you, Magdalena, for your sweet words. Um, D, you're asking, what is the success rate between one versus two blasts as transfers? Please remember, D, it's the same if you are vitrifying the blastocysts and doing them in two transfers as it would be to put back two in one. But obviously, if you put back two blastocysts straight away, fresh or frozen, the pregnancy rate is higher than with one. But so is the multiple pregnancy rate. Christy says, are the chances with implanting only one embryo on day three not as great as with implanting more than one? Uh, or waiting until day five? Christy, I think I've made a case for blastocyst transfer. Remember, in my opinion, and based upon a paper we published in Human Reproduction in 2007, embryos that don't make it to blastocyst are over 90% likely to be chromosomally abnormal, and you don't want them because they'd miscarry or cause a defect anyway. So why not go to blastocyst? So if you're going to transfer, I don't see the reason not to transfer blastocysts in virtually everyone because an embryo that makes it a blastocyst is far more likely to make a baby. Let me give you an example. If I have embryos on day three that look pristine in a 35-year-old woman, then one out of four of those embryos are going to be normal. And that means chromosomally normal and able to make a baby. If I have uh, blastocysts uh, from a 35 year old then one in two would be normal because many of the abnormal ones would have been culled out along the way and you're not reducing your chance by going to blastocyst um, the next question is again is here Denise can you explain the process with CGH testing can it be done with a fresh IVF cycle or would you wait for an FET Denise that would be the topic of a of a subsequent uh, a, a webinar that I'm going to plan on doing and Tom maybe we can set that up uh, embryo testing and who should have it when should it be done for a subsequent uh, webinar down the line but I can tell you it's far better to do a fresh um, um, CGH test and the reason is that if you do it fresh um, you can then vitrify the embryo at the blastocyst stage and hold it for subsequent transfer. I will discuss in an upcoming webinar what form of CGH to do. Should you do metaphase CGH on day three embryos or array CGH on blastocysts or day three embryos? Or should you do SNP array? There are various types of CGH tests. Should you use parental controls or not? Perhaps it'll be good to do a seminar, a webinar on that, Tom. Um, and if you have severe endometriosis, does this mean that there's more of a chance of NK cells compared to mild? No D. Regardless of the severity of the endometriosis, the risk of natural killer cell activation is about 30%. Jackie asks, I have a history of my uterus not contracting when delivering a baby. Does IVF increase my risk of that happening in labor? No, it does not. But if you have twins, the uterus is more distended and of course it won't contract as well as if there's only one baby in it. Lisa asks, uh, oh, thank you Lisa for your kind words, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're done. Here's what I request you do. Go to my website at haveababy.com Go to the discussion board, you can reach it from the home page. Sign in and enroll there. Post your questions on the SRM Las Vegas discussion board and I will get to them and answer them promptly for you. Alternatively, call 800-780-7437 and set up a, uh, a consultation where we can spend an hour together, again, audio-visually in contact through uh, video conferencing. We have that capability through the website and we can interact and talk to each other and discuss your problems, your issues, and uh, 
to do that just call that number or go to the website or on the blog and click click on the free consultation so to everybody who attended tonight thank you very very much uh, I enjoyed it uh, hopefully we can do more of these but I would very much appreciate your feedback through comments that you can write right here after this uh, webinar is over thank you and have a wonderful evening